So we're going to wait a couple minutes to start the webinar just to give everybody time to come in from the waiting room. But for those who are tuning in already, welcome to another round of our weekly platform trial Q&A webinars. Um, we took off the first week of October, but we're back in full swing for um, the next few weeks here. So uh, looking forward to tuning in more regularly. I think the numbers are starting to solidify here. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, and like I was saying, this is our weekly webinar series, um, open to the public. So if you enjoy these webinars and you know people who want to stay up to date about the platform trial and all the goings on, um, please refer them to these webinars, the more the merrier. Um, and this week, we don't have Dr. Paganoni with us. She's out of the office, but we're joined by Dr. Stokovic at the Healy and AMG Center here at Mass General. Um, so we can start off with the kind of general overview if we head to the next slide. For those who tune in regularly, you know the drill by now, but for those who uh, might be new or haven't heard yet, we are currently enrolling for two regimens, Regimen F with Calico and Regimen G with Denali. Um, those two are both active, openly looking for new participants. Regimen E with Celos Therapeutics completed enrollment and we're waiting to hopefully share more news on that front in terms of top line results, hopefully by the end of 2023. Um, and we'll use these webinars to keep you up to date about, um, you know, more exact timelines and when we can expect top line results there. Next slide. So the platform trial, in addition to being an avenue to test multiple potential therapies for ALS, it's also a way of learning about ALS and learning about more targeted approaches so that we can better test drugs that come down the pipeline in the future. Um, and the way that we're doing this is by using the platform trial, not only to test the potential efficacy of drugs, but um, to serve as kind of an endpoint development engine. So when I talk about endpoints, what we mean is, you know, the ways that we're measuring outcomes in a clinical trial. So how do we tell if the drug is successful? You know, can we use bindings in DNA? Um, our neurofilaments may be a key to figuring out what's successful. Um, we're looking at different biomarkers in the blood, urine, cerebrospinal fluid. And the CSF data is really important and something we're excited about, particularly because CSF is that fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And it gives us, you know, as best as we can, um, really direct information about what's going on in the central nervous system, which we think will be key to unlocking some answers in ALS. And we're also looking at exploratory measures for speech and digital outcomes as part of this trial too. And, and I'll hand it over to um, Dr. Sikowitz if she wants to talk about anything on that front as well. Yeah, hi Catherine, hi everybody. Yeah, the you know one um, we're getting some really good data from our exploratory endpoint, um, in particular um, uh, around the speech app, really being able to show uh, much sooner in a more sensitive way. Um, positive results, particularly with uh, regimen D. And then also with our breathing test at home, really showing that that's just, just as good really as what we do in the clinic. And both those things mean that as we move forward, we can move more and more of the study to the participants home and make it easier for them. This idea of kind of de what's called decentralized trials or, or really bringing the trials to the participants and making um, you know the barriers less to being part of research. So um, we've already learned a, a lot from that, from the digital apps. And um, then we, you know, we, we have neurofilament on everybody um, and genetics uh, data on everybody. And so we've we're also, um, you know, learning a lot about those biomarkers uh, in the fluid and the spinal fluid. Thank you, Kevin. And I, <laughs> we were tag teaming, so I don't know if you want to take over or if you want me to keep reading through here. Sure, I can give an update on the um, on the enrollment. So enrollment is going really well in our two current uh, enrolling regimens, regimen F and G. So just to remind you, F is with uh, Calico and G is with the company Denali. Um, the drugs target something called integrated stress response and uh, really to try to um, decrease the protein aggregation that we see in the cells and the, in the the cellular stress um, that happens in motor neurons and people with ALS. So um, almost 400 people have um, come into the study for these two regimens. Um, of those uh, 329 have already been 
uh, past master screening level and gone into one of the two regimens and, and uh, 286 have started the, the treatment. There's always a little bit of lag because there's time in between each of the steps, but this is enrolling um, really well. We think it'll be um, open for enrolling um, for a couple more months for these two. Um, so obviously if people are interested, uh, there's, there's plenty of time for these two regimens. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have 63 of our you know, 70 plus sites are um, open and active and enrolling in for regimen F and G. And uh, this is a list of, of uh, those sites. This is also found on our website as well as on clinicaltrial.gov. And you can call Catherine if you, uh, you don't see a center uh, near you or if there are any, any issue with getting in, if you're interested. Um, Catherine knows all the sites very well. And sometimes we'll know if a site protects um, you know, might have uh, have um, a lot of openings. Another one might not have uh, capacity at that time to help direct you to to a place that could see you soon if you're interested. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is how you can check on, on online and which sites are um, actively recruiting for um, for this study. Um, again, it's it's mo most of our sites now, and I hope hope all of them within the next couple of weeks. Uh, next slide. Um, so we also have uh, webinars uh, that we taped on the science behind the, the all the all the drugs that have been in the platform trial, but in particular for F and G, uh, these were done relatively recently. Uh, they're they're really good webinars. Are given by the companies um, and they really explain the the target, the rationale, how the drug works. Um, and we also have along with that some of the information about why um, you know getting. Um, Spinal fluid, or what we call CSF, is so important for both these regimens as a way to really um, look at biomarkers and tell um, drug that the drug is doing what it's supposed to do um, to help us see if if there might be some people that respond better uh, based on the response to this fluid biomarker. So we have some brochures around uh, lumbar punctures and uh, spinal fluid and why that's so important to ALS research and drug development. Uh, next slide. You know, Catherine and Allison, who are on the call, who are really here to help you and be a resource, people living with ALS, about not just the platform trial, but also other trials. Um, we have this every week, as you know, we have a couple upcoming webinars. The next um, two will be just, uh, you know, we, the, the typical people, a Q&A. Um, and then on the ninth, we've invited Dr. Suma Babu, to, um, uh, who's also very involved with the platform, to also talk about some of the new EA, um, expanded access protocols that are uh, coming forward. Uh, next slide. That's it. Good. So hopefully we'll have time for, for uh, questions. I think Catherine's gonna gonna yeah we did we have a few questions that came into the chat already and the first jumping off of what you're just saying for expanded access someone's wondering the regimens F and G are they allowing expanded access or when would they plan to offer it yeah good question uh, so at the at this moment we don't have expanded access uh, protocols for F or G both companies are considering this um, you know very seriously. Um, about providing that for you know a small number of people and when the best timing would be for that, um, we're going to have them come back soon. I think to come and and talk to all of you about those plans. Um, often companies will want to wait until they have some results, um, especially around safety, to make sure um, it's safe before going into compassionate use. Um, and so I'm hoping that we'll have small um, EAPs for both um, in the in the new year. And then somebody, there's a nice comment here just saying, thank you for hosting these webinars. They're so informative and helpful. We love um, them. And then there's lots of questions from that person. So one of the questions is, with respect to the data from each regimen for D, E, F, and so on, we don't know the nature of those results. Is the data from any one cohort positive? Um, or if that data is positive, is the view that the respective sponsor could potentially submit that drug for approval? Or would another trial, perhaps a larger phase three, really be required to support approval ultimately? Those are really good questions. So, so we've designed the platform trial to be what we call phase two three, meaning that it's it's for a lot of these drugs, it's the first time that they're really looking in this population of uh, people with ALS at efficacy and long term safety. Often, the regulatory agencies want two studies for for approval. 
or um, particularly in Europe, they want longer studies than this. So um, I, I think the most likely scenario is that this, if the platform trial was positive for a drug, they would need another study. There are exceptions in the US and Canada in particular, if something is very robust, like a really big effect, uh, one study might be um, sufficient. So of the first um, four drugs, we have shared those results uh, in press releases and in webinars, we are about to submit the papers. So eventually they'll be out there uh, as you know all the details in papers. Um, but um, the first two, A and B, were negative. Uh, C and D, so C is clean, but uh, uh, clean down the medicine, and D is prolenia. They both had some positive results. So they didn't hit on the primary outcome measure, but they hit on other ones. So in, in particular, uh, clean down the medicine had a positive effect on survival, which is obviously really important. Also had an effect on delaying time to serious events, such as delaying the time to needing like a feeding tube or delaying the time to needing, you know, respiratory support with BiPAP. So clinically important outcomes. And that our, the data in the platform trial really matched the data that they see in um, a study, a small study they did in Australia. So they are planning a phase three trial uh, that will be global. Um, and they will come actually here. I think we're even inviting them to come back here to talk about their plans. Uh, Regimen D by Prolenia, also had some po some positive uh, effects on on bulbar function, so speech and swallowing is measured by the digital apps as well as some of the subscales that we that we use in the ALSFRS, and also um, some positive results, particularly in subsets of people who were early and faster progressing, um, which we think again is just a trial technique rather than a biological uh, thing. They are also planning a phase three trial. So those, I think, in a way, was a success at the platform trial in a relatively short time with an efficient way, um, gave positive phase two data for, for those two companies that is uh, um, really sufficient for them to, to go forward to the large pivotal phase three trial. And the fifth one, regimen uh, E, uh, we're now in data closeout and, uh, and um, soon we'll start the analysis. So we hope to help those results um, you know, by the end of the year or so. Um, we'll, we'll definitely keep you guys up to date on the timelines for that. That was somebody's question. So to the person who asked about the outcome for Regimen E, um, stay tuned. We're still hoping to learn that ourselves. Um, somebody had asked, um, just to clarify what we were talking about, via email they asked whether those future plans for phase three trials based on the results of the platform trial, are those future studies, you know, part of, you know, this design that we're doing or are those separate being run by the drug companies? That's a, good, a very good question. So for for uh, for clean nanomedicine and for plenty of, they're going to be separate studies. Um, so a standalone phase three global studies. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think where you're going, that could you build that into the platform trial? Yes. And other platform trials in, in cancer, some cancers have done that where they um, can adapt within the same platform to go to phase three and we're discussing about whether that's something that we think is a good thing to do or not for the Healy platform trial. In terms of regimen F and G, I know we mentioned we're still recruiting for those, but when recruitment is complete, um, how soon after enrollment completes would you expect to have the top line data results? Yeah. It's usually, I'd say, about eight or nine months afterwards. So we have to wait until the last participant completes their 24-week follow-up. And then there's there's some time to to what we do to call data cleaning or database lock, um, and that can that can often take two months, you know, one to two months, and then there's a couple of weeks for the analysis. So that that typical time would be about nine months from the last the day the last person enro enrolls in the regimen. Someone is asking, do you think the FDA will take into account exploratory endpoints? or will it primarily be focused on ALS, FRSR, and survival? I think for, for approval, um, what really matters to the FDA is the um, primary outcome measure. And obviously the secondary outcome measures can be uh, supportive. Exploratory outcome measures are really just that. They're exploratory to try to, to learn uh, more about the illness and the response to the drug, to learn more about the outcome measure. Um, for example, the... Um, the, the digital apps, like the speech app, you know, are right now 
kind of exploratory because they're, they're new in, in AOS and we, we, we need to see if they respond to a treatment and also what do they clinically mean. But once you show that, like if you can show that a, a drug has a, a meaningful effect on a new outcome measure like that, it can move up in that hierarchy. It can move to a secondary, it can move to a primary. Um, but right now, at least for the platform trial, the primary is ALSFRS um, and the sec secondary is survival and breathing and strength. And the, the digital apps are still exploratory. Someone's asking about CSF. So for CSF biomarkers, are they specific to each trial or are generic markers for ALS emerging? Great question, but uh, actually both. So for each uh, of the of the regimens, so for F and G, there's specific biomarkers related to their drug and the mechanism of action of their drug. Um, but we're also looking at markers that are more um, about ALS. So you know, for example, neurofilament or measures of inflammation. Um, so really, we're looking at at both. Somebody's asking for clarification regarding expanded access in regimen F. Um, can you just repeat again whether there's EAP for regimen F? Sure. Right now, there's not uh, EAP for for regimen F or or regimen G. We do ask all our the partners that we work with if they will provide that, um, even if it's a you know for a small number of people. Both companies are are reviewing that request, and I am hopeful that they'll be both doing it in 2024. It does make sense, you know, for a new drug where we we're we're really learning a lot about it to to wait and make sure that it's past some of the initial safety or futility looks before opening a, a compassionate use. And uh, so, I, I think I think in the platform trial, these are going to come a little later in in the regimen, not right at the beginning, but a little later once once we've gathered that safety book. There's a couple more EAP questions, but I want to shift those maybe toward the end to talk about regimen F and G. So someone's asking, when do we expect to complete recruiting for F and G? I think based on the current projections of how, how enrollment is going, we think they're going to end around March. Now that might change, you know, for example, you know, during the holiday season, sometimes enrollment goes down or during big ALS meetings like the international MND meeting in December enrollment might go down a little bit, but th that's our current estimate. Um, you know, obviously, if people enroll faster, uh, or you know, then then it can end uh, end sooner. But um, we we know that um, there's a lot of interest in, in the trial, and the, the sites are doing all they can to get interested people in. For people who are interested in enrolling in either regimen F or regimen G. Someone's asking a clarify a question about what drugs are permitted. So if someone's taking the DEX stuff for bulbar symptoms, for example, is that allowed while someone's in regimen F? Yes, Nudexta is allowed. It's a marketed uh, drug for people with ALS, so that's allowed. Each of the, the drugs, because of their mechanism of action and their metabolism, have slightly different other medications that, that um, can't be taken with them, not necessarily ALS-related drugs, but other drugs. So there is a list that the sites have um, of, of drugs that can and can't be taken with them. So at the when if you're interested in it, then what the sites do before you come in is kind of go through your list of medications and see if there are any that might might have a conflict or not. I was gonna say the same thing. So if you're interested in the trial and you're not sure about those, you know, kind of fine details, you can reach out to a study team near you and they'll go through with a fine tooth comb um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis to, you know, cross those T's and dot the I's if anything comes up on that front. Um, back to our discussion about endpoints, somebody is asking, what do you think is the ideal combination of endpoints? I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a really good question. I, I still think that the ALS FRS is still a good outcome measure. So I know it's it's not perfect, but um, we, we've now seen um, four drugs that, that shift ALS FRS in a positive way. And so it does, it can pick up treatment effect and that's that's really important. Um, so I think that's it remains important. I think longevity is 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 important. Um, I think you know when we when people ask people living with ALS what's important, um, there are other things such as um, you know um, energy level, um, you know strength, ability to to do particular activities that what's called patient reported outcomes. So th those are starting to get uh, added into clinical trials as well. Somebody is asking, 
um, for participants in the trial, do we tell people in a particular regimen if they were on the drug or placebo once the trial is complete? Yeah, very good question. Um, so yes, we do. So there's the then the question is when. So typically, um, it's done once you're you're you've locked the database and you're done with your analyses. Um, so um, for example, for regimen A and B, where we we just now completed uh, locking the open label databases for those in the analysis, we are going to um, uh, be contacting participants to let them know what they were on. C and D we're still actively um, working on. So D is, still has an open label extension. So until that is uh, completed, we we can't um, tell people what they were on uh, in the double blind. And somebody's asking about future plans. So are there any other drugs on the horizon to be added to the platform trial? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're we're working with a, um, we, uh, another company right now, H, <laughs> I guess, um, and uh, we're um, we're in the what we call design phase. So we spend a couple months with the company working on things specific to their regimen, and then sometimes they want to go to the FDA with some questions. Uh, sometimes they don't have to do that. Um, and and we have a couple other companies who haven't applied yet uh, to be uh, part of the platform that are in discussions with us about it. So I'm hoping we'll have two or three more that we'll add in 2024. And I do want to take some of the questions about EAPs that are coming in. So I'll try to bundle them together. But for people who don't qualify to enroll in trials anymore, um, can you give an overview of how you have that discussion? How do you look for expanded access options? And then if there's multiple options, um, how do you talk through which options might be best for that person? Sure. So, you know, the whole concept of EAPs is relatively new still in ALS. I mean, we started at our center maybe in 2019, but now, as you know, there's NIH uh, support for this, and there's there's going to be over 40 centers in the U.S. that are going to be able to offer compassionate use to their uh, to their uh, the people that they care for who are not eligible for trials. So I think the first thing is to talk to your physician and see if they're one of those sites. And if they are, which which um, compassionate use studies they have and would you be eligible for it? Um, the thing about the compassionate use studies is we don't know for all these drugs whether or not they work or not. I mean, I, I'll just give an example. So two of the recently funded NIH ones are with the two companies I mentioned, Clean and Prolenia. So there we do have some data from the phase two um, for both of them. Um, but we don't know that one is better than the other. So I think it's really a discussion with your physician. Um, if they're offering both, you know, what's better for you. Um, and then if you're, if your site isn't offering any, then I think it's, it's, you, and again, I think you could call Catherine, um, you know, we could try to find another site close to you that has a compassionate use, or again, you could talk to your doctor about maybe trying to become a site. Um, th there's a couple options. And I know you touched on this. Somebody was asking if um, EAPs have exclusion criteria. You know, you mentioned talking to the provider about it. If you go and see a doctor who has EAPs, but, um, you know, similar to clinical trials, there's specific protocols for all of these different ones. So it could depend from one to another. And usually yeah. it would be listed online somewhere as well. Exactly. Yeah. So they do have some exclusion criteria, but not nearly as many as as it is in the, the main trial. The same safety things, for example, if there's a drug where if you have um, a thyroid problem, you know, you couldn't be in. Then the same for the compassion use. Uh, so there's same safety exclusions, um, but there aren't the exclusions around how long you've had the illness or your breathing status. So it should, should the barriers are, are, are much, much less. And I certainly can't speak to this, but somebody was asking if you could elaborate on recent data from Amalex's early video study. Oh, sure. I think I'm on that paper. We, we did, um, so we did um, a, a longer term follow up. We looked at all the data from people who had, um, you know, completed the double blind period where, where some were on drug and some on placebo and continued into the open label extension when everybody was on it. And um, we compared how people did to available natural history data, um, particularly this data set um, that we, we had started uh, years ago called PROACT. And we were able to show that when we kind of matched people in the trial to people that looked like them by certain characteristics in the natural history database, 
that there was a um, about a, a 10, 10.2 month survival benefit of taking Amelix. So this is really trying to learn, like if, if we have large data sets of people who have been in prior trials on placebo, can we use them to see if, if a drug you know, works? It's a, it's a way to start getting that, can we minimize placebos by using past data? And that's what that paper was, uh, was about. And while we're on the topic of approved drugs, somebody is asking, is there a comprehensive up-to-date list of approved treatments for ALS, um, one that providers can prescribe? That is a good question. I, I, um, there should be. I mean, I know that I know them, but I don't know whether there's a recent paper on it. It's probably a paper that needs to be written. You know, there's, the, there's what we call the three R's: Rilazole, Rilivrio, Radicava, and Nudexta. Those are the four that are approved for really any form of ALS. And then the fifth one is called Calsadi, which is for people with gene mutations in SOD1. Um. How about I'll we'll have to get back to you next week if there's a place, one place that describes all five of those. If there isn't, I think we someone should write a paper on that. Good question. Or even taking into account from you know US approved versus depending on where you live. Yeah. Um, that could affect it too. Yeah, it's very true. So somebody's asking, you know, because all patients with ALS are different, how are patients categorized or stratified? Is this something that you're bringing to regimen F and G? Or, you know, how does this differ? Yeah, it's such a good question. We, and we need to move towards that as a field, um, but we, we don't yet have the tools to do that well. So I would say the difference in, in F and G compared to A through E is we are using the baseline levels of neurofilament in the blood as a, a stratifying um, uh, I think, um, uh, variable. Um, because we know that um, the course of the illness can be different depending on someone's uh, neurofilament levels of the entry. So that, that's one change that we've done based on new knowledge. Um, we would like to start to add to the platform trial uh, arms just for some of the genetic forms. So, so for example, like drugs for C9 ALS to have, it, let's say we have two or three drugs with, for that genetic form of it, if someone comes into the platform trial and they have they carry the gene mutation for C9, that they would go into one of the drugs targeting their specific form. It's harder to do for the non-genetic variants here um, because we just don't have those tools, but, but that's where we want to go with the platform and we want to go as a field as we, as we develop those tools to be able to separate people a little bit more by their underlying biology. Earlier, we were talking about exploratory endpoints, and somebody has a question about, you know, in your opinion, how would you implement the quality of life endpoints that you were mentioning earlier? Oh, the uh, um, patient reported outcomes. Um, I, I do think that we would start. We should have them in every ALS trial, um, and they need, they need to be simple and important. To, and we and we need to work with people with the illness uh, for, um, to, to create them and to validate them. I would add them in again, this exploratory with the idea that these trials would then validate them and, and, um, and, and whether they're related to function, they're related to survival, um, can they pick up treatment effects? So I do think it'll take, uh, you know, it's not gonna take forever. It'll take like, you know, one or two studies that do this to be able to get those to move up in, um, in importance. And then I know we're close for time, so I definitely want to get this question and then I'll see how much time we have. But um, somebody's asking for clarification. So expanded access is for people who do not qualify to enroll in trials or qualify for a regimen. Um, for people who are in regimen F or regimen G, will they be given the real drug after the completion of the trial? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So if so, in the platform trial, there's only 24 weeks of where there's um, a, a, a placebo arm. So if the 75% of people get the drug, 25% placebo. After the 24 weeks, everybody in that regimen gets the active drug in what we call the open label extension. And they continue to receive that until we have the results of the, of the um, study. And if the study is, is negative, we would stop it. If it's positive, um, you know, and the company can afford it, then we would continue it. So for example, regimen D, uh, Prolenia, that open label extension is continuing for people who were in that study because of the, the results we saw in the double blind. 
for clean, they decided to switch everybody uh, from the open label to compassionate use, the same principle, and then expand it to other people as well. Yeah, and I'll clarify for the lingo, it's sometimes called open label extension, sometimes active treatment extension. So they're pretty much synonymous if you hear yes. one or the other. Um, there's a really good question here about um, some people believing that inclusion criteria at 36 months since onset and six month trials are detrimental to trial success. What are your thoughts now that the platform trial has been running for a while? Yeah, I, I think it depends on your sample size. So if so, if um, you have a very small study, yes, that 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 will mean that you have too much heterogeneity in your uh, population. But if you have the adequate sample size, it's just fine. And so we have powered it and modeled this so that with the um, now it's two forty to three hundred participants in the regimen that with those entry criteria, we have enough statistical power to pick up a 30% slowing or greater. So it's it's not like um, these two variables mean it's not gonna work. It's really the whole thing, the sample size, the population, the modeling to see what you, um, can you handle that difference between people? Now, having said all that, you know we um, we are in discussions about whether we want to go longer because as we get new drugs on the market that, that um, that work, um, you know, the good news is that that the course slows down for the population. So the people in the in the placebo arm will be going slower. The progression will be slower than two years ago. And so for that reason, we might want to go longer in our future regimen. So we're discussing that now, whether we might go up to eight months or nine months. Um, but it's it's driven by the change in standard of care um, and the improvement in people's course that that is dictating that. I think this kind of harkens back to to why we value the active treatment extension data so much too. Is there's a lot of really important information you glean from those few extra yeah. months. I say personally, I I want us to go the other direction. I want us to get shorter trials, and uh, um, and the reason and the, and the way we do that is by developing these surrogate biomarkers, these um, things like neurofilament or fluid biomarkers or digital biomarkers that change faster and predict longer term success. Yeah, that that's that's how most successful fields have gone rather than going longer and longer. Um, but to and, and that is one of the goals of the platform trials to try to develop those shorter term outcome measures. We have a few more questions. So I want to make sure do we have enough time yeah. or yeah. okay. Two more. So yeah. um somebody says, you know, it's nice to see that the FDA and you know the effects of the ALS Act do you think that in the next year there will become more open to a variety of data and endpoints? Yes, I think that there's a there's a huge initiative, uh, many of them, <laughs> from coming from this Act for ALS money to try to develop um, better outcome measures and better tools to um, actually separate people out, but more by their biology, that precision medicine. Um, and so, um, as you know, that. NIH also just funded a, a very large natural history study with um, uh, that will get just at those type of questions. So, and they've also funded um, CPATH, and, which is a, a, a group that develops new outcome measures to work on ALS. So um, the, it's fantastic to have all this new resources and attention to ALS. Um, I think this is a good one to end on. So. Um, you know, because you have a crystal ball, <laughs> what do you think the future of clinical trials looks like in ALS? And um, somebody thinks, you know, Keeley is amazing. Do you think that's going to be the norm or what do you see going forward? I, I do think we're going to see more and more platform trials. I just, you know, I've, I've been uh, giving a lot of talks and I know they want to do this in Asia. They want to do it in Australia. They want to do it in Canada. So I think that, I, I think people get that this is a much better way uh, when we have so many drugs to test. And we'll get, and people will get more creative about how to do it. I think the field is going to get to um, doing a lot more things uh, remotely, like what we call the decentralized, you know, really so that people can be in trials, really no matter where they live, they don't have to be close to a center. Um, and that, um, you know, we're going to get more effective drugs and that we're going to, we will start to um, have some drugs that are for this variant of ALS and others for another variant that, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, but that, that seems where the field is, is moving. And then I know there were a lot of EAP questions this week, so I'll just end by you know giving a reminder that on November 9th at this webinar, 
and um, we'll be specifically focusing the conversation about expanded access and updates on that front. So anybody with straggling questions can come to that webinar as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'll see you next week. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Allison. Bye-bye.